Everybody get up, it's time to slam now. We got a real jam going down. Welcome to the Space Jam. Here's your chance, do your dance at the Space Jam. First, there was nothing. And then, there was everything. Hello, I'm Morgan Freedom. And today, we will be discussing the milestones of the universe. When I was a young child, my father would tell me stories of the world we lived in. He would say everything we knew existed in an incomprehensibly vast space called the universe, and everything we could see or feel was made of something called matter. I would ask my father, what is matter? And he would respond, nothing. What is matter with you? But this isn't a story of the universe between me and my father. This is a story of the universe between me and you, universe. Scientists say that the universe started with a bang, an explosion of life from a void of nothing they call the Big Bang. But how exactly did the universe arise? How did so much stuff form from nothing? To build up to the very big, we'll have to start with the very small. Albert Einstein is a leading scientist in the field of particle physics. His work has led him to investigate the origins of the first atoms and particles in the universe. The very first particles appeared fractions of a second after the Big Bang. Now around this time, the universe was incredibly hot from all this energy from the explosion. The protons, neutrons, and electrons were zipping around at huge speeds. It was like a game of particle marbles. You have all these particles speeding past each other with all this energy, and occasionally, they collide. But they weren't really able to accomplish anything with these glancing blows. However, three minutes after the Big Bang, the universe was able to cool to such an extent that protons and neutrons were able to slow down. And at these speeds, they could interact. These formed the first atomic nuclei. 20 minutes after the Big Bang, you get your light elements, your helium and hydrogen, and your heavier elements, lithium and beryllium. Electrons, however, were a different story from protons and neutrons. They had much higher speeds than the other particles, and would take longer to slow down. It would be 380,000 years after the Big Bang before electrons could interact with these positively charged atomic nuclei and form the first neutral atoms. The creation of these atomic nuclei is referred to as nucleosynthesis, and this creation led to what is commonly known as the cosmic background radiation. Because there were only atoms and stars had not yet formed, there was no light in the universe, and it was about to begin an age of darkness. Neil Legweek is an expert on things that are not well lit. For a long time, scientists have wondered how we can see in a time epitomized by darkness. I think I might have a solution. In the beginning of the universe, there were cold hydrogen atoms. Within these atoms, there were electrons and protons. If the electron and the proton had the same spin, nothing would happen. However, if the electron were to go down an energy level and change its spin, it would release a 21 centimeter wavelength photon. Leg Week believes that we can use these photons to create a map clearer and more descriptive than the cosmic background radiation map. This map might help us understand how and why galaxies form. I love maps. Times were dark for the universe, but there was a light on the horizon. Starlight. The appearance of the first stars in the universe would be the end of the Dark Ages. Desmi Roland and Day Hayden are two leading experts for stars and galaxies in their respective fields. So the time period is around 100 million to 250 million years after the Big Bang. In this cold period of the universe's history, gas clouds were able to condense and accumulate, forming the first stars. These stars were many times larger than our sun, and inside these stars, heavier elements were being produced. These heavier elements would eventually be spit out and spread around, and they would form the bases for the earliest planets. As these stars were forming, the universe was getting hotter and hotter, 
and instead of there being individual stars popping up, there started being whole nebulas of stars being created. According to Day Hayden, these first stars would continue to emit hot gas and solar dust over the course of their life, but it will take their death for the first galaxies to be born. These first stars and their supernovae would play pivotal roles in the creation of the first galaxies. The first galaxies, on the other hand, were completely different animals from the first stars. I'm Day Hayden. So we have all these clouds of dust, but due to gravitational forces and the blast from supernovae, these clouds, they become more dense and they group together. Once they are more dense, they form into stars. And from this density of stars, we get galaxies. A hundred million years after the Big Bang, the first star. Then 500 million years after that, the first galaxy. Stars and galaxy, inseparable. Two cosmic peas in the cosmic pod of the universe. Podiverse. Now we've talked about the first galaxy, but what about our galaxy? How did this little corner of space we've come to call the Milky Way form? Hmm, Milky Way. I'm going to go buy a chocolate bar. When he's not taking care of his lawn, Mo deGrasse Tyson is making strides in researching the history of our galaxy. From what we know, the Milky Way is about 13.2 billion years old. We believe the Big Bang led to the distribution of irregular clumps of dark matter in the universe. The Milky Way spun into a big disk. The spinning also caused spiral arms to form. Within the center of the disk was a bulge, about 10 billion years old. Our Milky Way conceals a terrible secret. At its heart, within the bulge, lies a supermassive black hole. I have chocolate stuck in my teeth. We've talked about the first elements. We've talked about the first stars and galaxies, but what about planets? What are planets? What are they made of? How do these celestial balls form? Bill Nee Dysiansky may have the answer. Bill Nee is a world-renowned science educator and mechanical engineer. His fascination with space and soccer balls had him studying the planets and exoplanets in the universe since he was 12 years old. He knows nothing else about anything else, but he may have the answer. Planets and exoplanets are celestial objects which orbit stars. They have enough mass to be rounded by their own gravity, but they are a mixture of numerous elements and are some of the most diverse objects in space. However, these beautiful planets do not have such beautiful beginnings. Tiny dust particles interact with each other through electrostatic forces. These particles attach to a clump until it's massive enough to attract other particles via gravity. So the formation of the very first planets were a lot like this soccer ball. You had all these collisions merging together until finally you get a planet. Planets form from collisions between rocks and clumps of particles within clouds of dust. But it wasn't until about a billion years after the Big Bang that the first stars began to die. The force of these supernovas compressed the clouds to a dense enough level for the particles to interact and form the first planets. Planets form by means of collisions and supernovae, but there are even bigger and badder things which have violent beginnings. Now we have all these stars and all these planets. When you put them together, you get what one Sriracha Hot Sauce is an expert on, the solar system. Our prevailing theory as to the origins of the solar system is that our sun formed from a compression of the gas clouds caused by the supernova of a star in a nearby star cluster. Due to this explosive birth, the newborn solar nebula began spinning at high speeds. Near the center, where it was hotter, Clumps of debris formed moons and rocky planets, such as Earth. Farther towards the rim of the rotating disk where it was cooler, the gas giants and icy planets formed. These planets finished forming a few million years after the supernova. 
All his life, Winnie Hupp Jr. has been alive. He was born, he breathes, and he will die. He is a certified life master. But where did life like Mr. Hutt Jr. come from? The most well-known theory of the origin of life is that chemicals within shallow pools of water on the early Earth's surface eventually reacted enough to form the building blocks of life, amino acids. Of course, this is heavily reliant on chance and the hospitality of our early planet, a thing in which Earth did not excel. Fortunately, there is an equation that might provide some insight into this dilemma. Drake's equation reveals that there is a very slim chance that no other life forms exist in our universe. The odds that we were the first are not in our favor considering the Earth's relatively young age. Another theory resolves this problem in stating that Earth's first life may have hitched a ride on visiting space debris. So which one is it? Has Earth always been the only home for life in our universe? Or is there a stranger alien source out there from which we sprang? Scientists themselves are not so sure, but what is sure is that we are alive. And as long as we are alive, we will ponder the mysteries of the universe. Life is a miracle. I'm a miracle. You're okay. We've followed the universe throughout its journey, from the cataclysmic Big Bang to the appearance of life in the universe. And 13.8 billion years later, here we are. But life is not all well and good for, well, life. The universe is not eternal, but rather approaching a terrible end. We like to think of the universe as perpetual, an endless system of space beyond measure and mystery beyond comprehension. But the fact of the matter is, this all shall end. Mitchell Kaku is a man with experience in things dying. I've had two failed marriages, I've watched both my parents die, I never watered my office plants. My career has been in a dead end now for about 15 years. I started wondering about the death of bigger things. Especially the universe. How could something so big just die? The answer is the big freeze. In the universe, there's all this heat. Now heat, as we know, moves from hotter things cooler things. But according to the second law of thermodynamics, we also have entropy, and things behave in a way as to uh. increase the entropy. So let's say I'm entropy, and the sandwich is the free heat in the universe. As entropy increases, that is, I eat the sandwich, the free energy will decrease and decrease and decrease, so eventually there's absolutely none left, and no heat can be transferred into the universe. So there we have it, story of our universe, from beginning to end, violent birth to cold dark death, and all the mysteries in between. I'm Morgan Freedom, good night. <laughs>